in chapter seven, you are going to see me stand in front of you with a stopper on the string, and I'm going to do this a lot. Because in this chapter, we're going to talk about the motion of the object moving in a circle. And I'm going to take this and relate it to stuff that you already know. So basically today, what we're going to do is we're going to take stuff that you know about linear motion, like linear velocity, linear acceleration, etc., and we're going to convert that over to angular information, like angular velocity and angular acceleration. So basically, we're taking what you already knew, moving in straight lines, and putting it into moving in a circle. On that note, let's take a look at the stopper on the string. Here it is, located right there. When it is located right there, we can describe its location by its x, y coordinates. x and y. Now x and y are going to identify the location of the stopper on the string. The x, y coordinate system has a specific name. It's the one you've been using for a long time. Who can tell me the name of the x, y coordinate system? Mr. Lerner. No, no. It's not the name of it. It has a specific name. Thank you. It is called the Cartesian coordinate system, the XY coordinate system, sometimes called the rectangular coordinate system, more oftenly called the Cartesian coordinate system. So if we use the XY coordinate system, the Cartesian coordinate system, Claire, when you look at the stopper on the string, it's moving. You see it? Does its X position change as a function of time, where it's located in the X direction? Like from here to here. Yeah. Yes. Notice its x position changes as a func function of time. What about its y position, Claire? Also changes. So if we use the Cartesian coordinate system to describe the location of the stopper on the string, both the x and the y uh, positions change as a function of time. So we are not going to use the Cartesian coordinate system to describe the location of the stopper on the string. Who can tell me what coordinate system we are going to use, Carolyn? Polar coordinates. We are going to use polar coordinates. If you have never heard of the polar coordinate system, don't worry. It's fine. We're, we, I introduce it and we talk about it, but in the end, you don't have to know much about the polar coordinate system. Okay, here we go. Rather than describing the location of the stopper on the string using x and y, we are going to use r and theta the radius of the string and the angle at which the string is at. So, if instead we use the polar coordinates, I suppose I should write this down. <coughs> if instead we use r and theta to describe the location of the stopper on the string, Claire, now does theta change as a function of time? Yeah. Yes, does r the radius change as a function of time? No. no. So notice, when you use polar coordinates, r and theta to describe, the, to describe the location of the stopper on the string, only one of the variables changes as a function of time, and this is clearly much easier to work with. Now, we can go back and forth between rectangular coordinates and the, cart uh, between Cartesian coordinates and the polar coordinates by using what, James? If I know x and y, for example, and I'm trying to find, like, like trying to find r or theta or something, how we relate these four variables. Look, look at the picture here. I'll do this for you. Oh, um, sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. What is opposite theta? Uh, y. Y and hypotenuse. In other words, y is equal to r times the sine of theta. We can do the same thing with cosine. Cosine of theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse, where the adjacent is r, I'm sorry, the adjacent is x, and the hypotenuse is r. Therefore, we get x is equal to r times the cosine of theta. So you can see, we already know how to go back and forth between car the Cartesian coordinate system and the polar coordinates. It's just using so much Good. Let's do this. Ah. Pi. 
what, Kaiser, is pi? A number? True. It is a number. You've seen this before, yes? Yeah. Good. Jack? So far we have that pi is a number, Jack. Um, it's continuous. It never ends. The... It is called an irrational number. It never ends and never repeats. True. Pertinent. We even know its number to a certain number, if you think. One point, or 3.14159. Going on, yeah, I'm sure somebody else knows it farther. <laughs> Kudos to you. Uh, what else? So far we have that it's a rational number. We even know some of its value. What else do we know about pi? Carol. It's a radian, like an angle. We have a relationship, but we can't, we, we haven't even uh, to say, but that's not actually correct to say that pi is equal to 180 degrees. It's not quite correct. We're almost there. Rick? Is the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of the circle? It is, by definition, pi is equal to the circumference divided by the diameter. Anytime you take the circumference of a circle and divide it by the diameter of that same circle, you will get the number pi. 3.14159, irrational number, all of those things. Just to put it in perspective, let's rearrange this equation. Circumference equals pi times the diameter. We already know that the diameter is uh, 2 times the radius. In other words, circumference equals 2 pi r. Does that look familiar? <laughs> yes, it does. That's because it comes from the definition of pi. Pi is equal to the circumference divided by the diameter, which is really the same thing as circumference equals 2 pi. Okay, getting to the dimensions for pi. Meters divided by meters. What do we get, Aaron, when we take meters and divide it by meters as far as dimensions are concerned? Um, it cancels out. It cancels out. So what do we get? One. We get something that is dimensionless. So what do we call that? Has a specific name. The circumference divided by the diameter is pi what? Totally. Radians. Pi is in radians. But it turns out that radians are dimensionless. Because pi represents the number of radians, which is actually meters divided by meters, so it is dimensionless. So it's a placeholder. And we're going to use the fact that radians are dimensionless many times in this class in Chapter 7. Because it is a placeholder, and when we don't need it, we can simply get rid of it. Okay, so let's do this piece. One revolution class is equal to how many radians? Try that again. Class, one revolution is equal to how many radians? Two pi. Two pi radians. It is not equal to two radians. It is equal to two pi radians. Which is equal to how many degrees, class? 360 degrees. Just so you know, Catherine, or Carolyn, that's it's pi radians equals 180 degrees. It's not pi equals 180 degrees. You need the dimension of pi radians. Now, Class, did I put a box around this? No, I did not. This is an open box. I like to refer to your brain as the open box. Here it is. I have the open box, and in this class, I put stuff into the open box. There it is. I can help you. We fill it up sometimes, but it does overflow a little bit. We try to get the rest of it, just shut it back in. Um, but realize it is already in the open box. You already know one revolution equals two pi radians equals 360 degrees. It is in there. It is not something you're going to get on a quiz or final exam. You need to remember this. Uh, let's do. Let's okay, you've done. Oh, I want to do this. Class R stands for. Radius. Try it again. R stands for radius. Radius. Then what do we use for radians? 
Do we use an R? No, we can't use an R because R is already taken. So what we use is R A D stands for radians. So shorthand for radians is R A D. I do understand that those of you who come from the text messaging generation have a really hard time with that A and that D. Two extra letters. Oh, ye gads. <gasps> what are we going to do? That's right. You need to write down R A D for radians, please. Do not write R. That means radius, which is something entirely different. Please. Okay, so we've got. Good. Um, let's do. Good. So now. We're going to talk about the stopper on the string moving specifically from one location to another. So as it moves from here to here, we're going to talk about the linear distance traveled by the stopper on the string as it moves from here to here. It clearly moves through an angle, but we need to also define the linear distance that it travels. So it moves from here to here. It moves through some theta. The radius is going to stay the same because it's just the, the radius of the string. But what is the linear distance traveled by the stopper on the string called when it moves through this angular displacement? Um, Carol, arc. it is called the arc length. The symbol we use for arc length is an S. For me, I have to use a lowercase cursive s. That's right, that's my lowercase cursive s. The reason I do that is because my s will end up looking like a five if I don't, and in the long run, it just gets worse and worse. So I use a lowercase cursive s, which you will not confuse with anything else. So s stands for the arc length. Specifically, that simply means it is the distance traveled when moving along an arc. It's a linear distance traveled when moving along an arc. The equation is S equals R times theta. And that is a box equation. S equals R times theta. Now, when you use this equation, you must use radians. And we'll talk about why in just a moment. To take and look at a specific case, what is the arc length when something moves through a full circle? So if I take, and for example, we talked about the duct tape, and it moves through a full circle. What is the arc length called when it moves through a full circle? It is the circumference, right? So the circumference, if we talk about a specific case, if we use S equals R theta, the circumference is going to be equal to the radius multiplied by the theta. The theta in radians, when you go through one revolution, is 2 pi radians. So that's equal to 2 pi. So its circumference is equal to 2 pi times r. Oh, there it is again. Circumference equals 2 pi r. This equation, circumference equals 2 pi r, is actually a special case of s equals r theta. s equals r theta is the more general equation Circumference equals 2 pi r is the equation that you use when you have a, when you've gone through a full circle. But if you've only gone through part of a circle, you're going to use s, the arc length, equals r times theta. 